All right, thanks everyone for joining us. Um, if you haven't yet, feel free to use the chat box to introduce yourself. Um, we are also recording today's webinar, so if you have to leave at any time, no worries. Um, or if you want to share it with a friend afterwards, we will send out the recording afterwards to all the registrants. Um, we also have the closed captioning on today. If you would like to view the closed captions, you can click on the CC live transcript button, which is usually at the bottom of your Zoom screen, or sometimes you have to hit the more button in order to see different options. <clears throat> And there you can access the closed captions. Um, closed captioning is done by robots, so please excuse any errors with the transcription. Uh, and with that, I will pass it off to Larry to introduce today's event. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, my name is Larry Gilbert, and I am co-coordinator with Al Mitty, M-Y-T-T-Y. -T uh, and we are co-coordinators of the Veterans for Peace chapter from the Villages, Florida, as well as the World Beyond War Central Florida chapter. And we are sponsoring this event. And it's my, uh, my pleasure to introduce uh, this webinar entitled, What Could Trigger Nuclear War with Russia and China? And our guest speaker uh, today is Bruce Gagnon, a co-founder and coordinator of the Global Network Against Weapons and Nuclear Power in Space. Uh, he's been working on peace and space issues since 1982. For 15 years, he coordinated the Florida Coalition for Peace and Justice. He was a Vietnam era veteran and was trained as an organizer by the United Farm Workers Union. He now lives in Brunswick, Maine, and his blog is called Organizing Notes. And I think you'll find that uh, in the chat uh, where you can keep up with his, with, with his work. It's called Organizing Notes. So without any further ado, uh, I'll turn it over to Bruce Gagnon and uh, go ahead, Bruce. Thank you very much, Larry and uh, Greta, for organizing this event. And thank you all for joining it. Uh, I think if you look at this map, you see that both Russia and China are two of the very largest countries in the world. And um, they have long, deep history. And so I would say that it's a colossal error for the United States today to be challenging both of these countries, trying to force regime change as it is. All right, I got to see about changing there. I grew up in a military family. My dad was in the Air Force, my stepfather. Uh, and we moved to bases all over the world. During the Cuban Missile Crisis, we were uh, living at Ellsworth Air Force Base in South Dakota, a B-52 bomber base. And I was one of those kids crawling under my desk, duck and cover. So the idea of nuclear war has been inside of me for a long time. In 1971, I too joined the Air Force uh, I had grown up on military bases. I was quite conservative at the time. And uh, I was stationed after my training at Travis Air Force Base in California. There was an airlift base for the war in Vietnam. And every weekend there were protests outside the gate. This was the front gate of Travis Air Force Base. Uh, people were out there uh, handing out flyers with signs and it created a dynamic inside the base where we would talk about the war and we would talk about these protests in the chow hall, in the barracks at night and on our jobs. And that process of being at this base turned me into a peace activist. That was 1971, 1972. So now on to first Ukraine. In late 2013, early 2014, Washington orchestrated a coup d'etat the active participants uh, for the Obama administration <clears throat> running that particular coup d'etat were Vice President Biden, Victoria Nuland, who was 
Hillary Clinton's Assistant Secretary of State for European Affairs, and Senator John McCain. Newland is on the right handing out bread in the, at the famous Maidan Square at the time of the so-called revolution. And uh, John McCain on the left came and spoke there on several occasions to the crowd. This particular picture, he's with one of the Nazi leaders of the effort to uh, force this coup d'etat. The Nazis in Western Ukraine have a long history. Uh, during World War II, when Hitler invaded the former Soviet Union, killing 27 million Soviet citizens. He swept through Ukraine, and this guy at the top center, uh, Stefan Bandera, put on a Nazi uniform. He was a nationalist leader in Western Ukraine, and his people joined Hitler in killing tens of thousands of Jews, gypsies, French, uh, excuse me, uh, Pol Polish people, and Russian ethnic citizens. And so the, the Nazis in Western Ukraine have long hated Russian ethnics. And, th and they have been active throughout all these years. During Hitler's occupation of Western Ukraine, the top photo, Ukrainian citizens pledging their allegiance to the Nazis. And the bottom photo, a more contemporary picture showing the Azov Battalion and other Nazi battalions of which there are several uh, marching uh, in parades and such. After the coup, this picture was taken of the SBU headquarters in Kiev. SBU stands for the Security Bureau of Ukraine, equivalent to our FBI or CIA. And so I think this picture well illustrates who was really running the show in Ukraine after the coup. At the same time that the coup happened, the people of Crimea were watching it on their television screens. Some Crimean citizens actually went to protest in support of the government that was thrown out because of this coup. They were very upset about the entire operation. And so they quickly self-organized a referendum at which 97% of the Crimean citizens voted to seek to rejoin with Russia. Crimea had been part of Russia since the time of Catherine the Great in the 1700s. So when people say that Russia annexed Ukraine, that they grabbed it, that they stole it, uh, that's not true. The citizens of Crimea voluntarily asked to be part of Russia again and not one person was killed in that process. This is a map of Ukraine. Again, the Western Ukraine is near the Poland border in the upper left corner. This is where the Nazis predominate in that blue area where mostly Ukrainian is spoken. The Donbass region where the fight is going on today over in the red part on the map on Eastern Ukraine, right along the Russian border. Mostly Russian is spoken here. These are Russian ethnic citizens. This is where uh, the Nazis have been attacking ever since the coup in 2014. Soon after the coup happened in 2014, the United States and NATO formed a military training base in Western Ukraine. I know about this because one of my friends has a son in the US Army Special Forces. He was stationed at Fort Carson, Colorado, and his units were repeatedly sent to this base in Western Ukraine to help train the Nazis who were brought into the military, given fancy uniforms, trained, and sent out uh, as special forces, Ukrainian special forces. Uh, the United States was absolutely involved in this process. And here we see four of our congressional representatives from the US on the left, Lindsey Graham, Senator from South Carolina. Then, to, then uh, next is John McCain, then Senator from Arizona. 
And then the Democrat, Amy Klobacher, you might remember her, she ran for president in the last Democratic primaries in the last round. She's from Minnesota. And then to her, uh, on the far right, uh, with the glasses on, is Representative Marcy Captur, Congresswoman from Ohio. So again, at, at this particular event, there's a video available where both uh, Lindsey Graham and John McCain were bragging how we're going to arm you, we're going to train you, and we're going to fight those Russians, and we're going to win, we're going to defeat those Russians. This was uh, soon after the coup in 2014. And so the Nazis were then sent uh, to the eastern part of the country, as I said, to attack the citizens of the Donbass. Now, the Donbass is was always a uh, technology center for the country of Ukraine, but they have a lot of coal mines there. And so as these Nazis began attacking the people of Eastern Ukraine, the miners came out of the coal mines to defend their communities, to defend their families. What was happening was after the coup in 2014, one of the first things the new government did was to declare that the speaking of Russian in Ukraine would be illegal, no longer allowed. And so the people in Eastern Ukraine that are predominantly Russian ethnics who speak Russian, they began holding peaceful protests, marches through their cities, and they started organizing referendum signature campaigns. They said, we want to have a federated Ukraine. They, they weren't talking about joining Russia then, uh, they wanted a federated Ukraine where they would have local autonomy to make their own decision about what language they would speak, what their children would be taught in their schools, et cetera. And so that is when the Nazis were sent there to attack them. This is another one of the groups. This is the Azov Battalion. Uh, you see the Nazi flag, the, e the EU flag there. Well, I went to uh, the Donbass, to the cities of Donetsk and uh, Lugansk in October of 2019. The building on the left, this picture taken at that time, was a example of how the Nazis lined up on what's called the line of contact, had been shelling the people of Donbass since 2014. And during this period of time, 14,000, more than 14,000 citizens, Ukrainian, Russian ethnic citizens in the Donbass had died at the hands of these Nazis and their shelling and their killing of these people. And more than 34,000 citizens in the Donbass had been wounded. Now, did you ever hear anybody in American government say, oh, what a terrible thing. Oh, what a terrible thing. These Ukrainian citizens are being killed. No, in fact, the United States and NATO were arming, training, and directing them. This is a bridge in the Lugansk area that goes over a river. And the Nazis shelled the middle part of the bridge. People use this bridge to go from Lugansk to the town on the other side of the river, still in Ukraine, to get their pensions. So it's mostly senior citizens. So when the bridge was knocked out, these senior citizens and their friends had to build these rickety staircases that people had to go down and then up the other side in order to get to the other side of the river. So this is the way the Ukrainian government was, treat, was treating their own citizens in Eastern Ukraine. And when I was there and I saw this, what I saw was mostly senior citizens who had a difficult time traversing this very rickety staircase. I also went to the city of Donetsk, and as we entered the city, the very center of the city, we saw a series of apartment buildings that had been vacated because the Nazis had been shelling them again since 2014. The Minsk agreements were created by Russia, Belarus, Ukraine, France, and Germany. This was done 
in the middle of the war. So around 2016, 2017, that period of time, the agreement basically said that we're gonna have a federated Ukraine, that the people in Eastern Ukraine, the Russian ethnic citizens, Ukrainian citizens, would have the right to local autonomy. All countries, including Ukraine, signed them, but Ukraine never implemented them. So the president Poroshenko at that time, and then later Zelensky who followed him, Zelensky actually ran on a, on a pledge to end the war. The citizens wanted the war over. And in fact, the most votes he got was by the Russian ethnic citizens in the Donbass because they wanted this war over. They were the ones suffering from it the most. But the Minsk agreements were never honored by Ukraine. Why? Because the United States and NATO were telling them not to, because the United States and NATO wanted a war. At the same time, Nord Stream 2 pipeline was built under the, under the water, under the ocean, from Russia going to Northern Germany to deliver natural gas. And on several occasions, when the pipeline was being constructed, the United States was making uh, efforts to, uh, provocative efforts to uh, delay or even shut down the building of this pipeline, but they were not successful. It was eventually built. And then after the uh, war that began on, in late February of this year, uh, the US pressured uh, uh, Germany to not start up Nord Stream 2 which they acquiesced and did. They shut it, shut it down before it ever began. Now, why does the United States not want Nord Stream 2 to be built? Why didn't the United States want uh, natural gas to be delivered from Russia to, to Germany? The reason is because the US wanted to sell LNG, liquefied natural gas, sent on ships from the United States it's a frack gas product from fracking. They wanted to ship that across the Atlantic and then sell it to the European countries at a much more expensive rate than what the Europeans were paying for Russian natural gas. But the only way the United States could pull this off was by number one, shutting down Nord Stream 2, and secondly, by creating the conditions for a war. In addition, Monsanto has been itching for years to get their hands on Ukraine, which has been long called the breadbasket of Europe. You should know that Russia long ago banned the use of GMOs inside of their country. And the fear of the big agribusiness corporations that are pushing uh, GMO products is that Ukraine, if it was under Russian influence, and partnership that they would follow Russia on the GMO question. And so another reason that the United States was pu pushing this conflict was the GMO issue. This is a, a, uh, a website by the RAND Corporation. You might remember the RAND Corporation from the Vietnam War. They did the secret study called the Pentagon Papers of the war in Vietnam, telling the story about how that war began. And this particular uh, study published in 2019 called Overextending and Unbalancing Russia. And in this, they basically say that they will, the United States will use Ukraine as a tool to destabilize Russia and to cost Russia heavily forcing regime change in Moscow. So why does the United States want regime change so badly that it risks war and then even nuclear war with Russia? Well, I would suggest it has a lot to do with climate change. Russia has the largest land border with the Arctic Sea. And because of climate change, the Arctic ice is melting. And the Western oil corporations, resource extraction corporations, want to drill baby drill up in that region. But they can't 
uh, as much as they'd like because Russia has the largest border. And so one of the ideas then is to break Russia up like the United States during the Clinton administration did to Yugoslavia when it bombed the living hell out of Belgrade, broke Yugoslavia up into smaller countries where conflict continues to this day, especially between Kosovo and Serbia. It's been in the news in just the last few days. So this is the overall plan for Russia, but they just can't go and do it. First, they have to have a multi-year process of demonizing Vladimir Putin and Moscow. And they've done that, as you well know, because you've been listening to it nonstop on NPR, on MSNBC, on CNN, on Fox News, and all the rest, in the Washington Post and the New York Times. But it's interesting because at the same time that this war began on February 24th, on that same day, NATO began a war game called Cold Response. And this war game started on the Norway-Russia border. If you look at this map, just above Finland, Sweden, you find Norway. And Norway sweeps around to the right. And, it's, and it drops down. And it has a border with Russia. So it was there that cold response began at the same time that Russia moved into Ukraine. And then also the US Navy has been saying for years that we must control the Arctic in the coming years. So that thus this Navy study called the Arctic Roadmap 2014 to 2030. Bill Clinton broke a promise that was made to Russia, <clears throat> to Mikhail Gorbachev, at the time of the collapse of the former Soviet Union. The big question at that time was, what's going to happen to Germany? It was divided. Remember, East, communist, West, capitalist, Germany. And so uh, the US and NATO and uh, Germany wanted to reunify Germany. And, but Gorbachev and Russia was, uh, and the Soviet Union was concerned about a reunified Germany. But Gorbachev asked, we'll agree to it, the unification of Germany, if you promise us that NATO will never expand towards Russia. We need that security guarantee. And so Secretary of State Jim Baker, at that time working for Daddy Bush, George Herbert Walker Bush, promised Gorbachev that NATO would never ex expand one inch. When Bill Clinton became president, he started a thing called NATO enhancement. And since that time, NATO has been on steroids. NATO has now moved into Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, Romania, Bulgaria, and, and other countries as well. They tried to get into Georgia. They're trying to get into Ukraine. They, they tried to do a coup d'etat in Belarus last year. NATO is on steroids. At the same time, NATO is talking about expanding into the Asia Pacific. And it has been recruiting Asia Pacific countries like South Korea, Japan, Singapore, Australia, New Zealand, and others as NATO partners. And so NATO is actually trying to become a global alliance so that when it wants to invade another country, the idea is that you don't have to go to the UN, to the Security Council to ask for permission to start a war because Russia and China, permanent members of the Security Council will block it. But if we can create, NATO says, a global NATO, we can then say that we represent the international community and we have the right to intervene to quote unquote, protect any country we wish to. So this is very destabilizing, I hope, for obvious reasons. At the same time, the United States has built two missile launch bases. The picture on the left, just above the US uh, Admiral's heads, you see the word Poland. This is a missile launch base being built in Poland. 
And also one has been built in Romania. That's the other picture. They're called Aegis Ashore. Where I live in Bath, uh, near Bath, Maine, they build Navy Aegis destroyers that are outfitted with missile launchers. And they've had the most success uh, in the so-called missile defense uh, testing phase. And so they've decided to take that technology and also put it on the ground, calling it Aegis Ashore. So these uh, missile launch facilities can launch two types of rockets. Number one, a missile defense interceptor that is part of US first strike strategy. The idea is after a, a US first strike attack on Russia or China, something they annually war game at the US Space Command on computers, after a first strike attack, Russia or China would try to launch their retaliatory capability. And it is then that these so-called missile defense shields would be used to pick off a Russian or Chinese retaliatory strike, giving the US a quote unquote successful first strike attack. At the same time, these launchers can also launch first strike attack cruise missiles, Tomahawk cruise missiles that are nuclear capable. So from Romania and Poland launch facilities, the US can launch a first strike attack on Russia, reaching them in just a matter of minutes. It's a Cuban missile crisis in reverse. How is Russia to respond to this? And again, what have you heard in the corporate media in the United States or even throughout the West, like on BBC or anywhere else? What have you heard about these bases? Virtually nothing, I'm sure. Well, Putin, you know, at the time that uh, Russia launched the, uh, what they called special military operation in February into Ukraine, I asked some of my friends, what do you think Russia should have done? They said they should have negotiated. Why didn't they talk with Ukraine and, and NATO? Well, the truth is they have been talking for a long time. This is a picture at the 2007 Munich Security Conference where Vladimir Putin is speaking to the assembled. And look in the front row there in the middle, you see then uh, Secretary of uh, Defense, Bill Gates, Senator John McCain, and Senator Joe Lieberman looking at Vladimir Putin. And what did Putin say? He says, quote, I think it is obvious that NATO expansion does not have any relation with the modernization of the alliance itself or with ensuring security in Europe. On the contrary, it represents a serious provocation that reduces the level of mutual trust. And we have the right to ask, against whom is this expansion intended? And what happened to the assurances our Western partners made after the dissolution of the War Pact, uh, Warsaw Pact? Where are those declarations today? No one even remembers them. He's talking about the promises made to Gorbachev that NATO won't expand one inch towards Russia. So the truth is, Russia is very frustrated that the United States in particular has not been responding to any of their appeals for many, many years about security, mutual security guarantees. And in fact, the US walked away from the ABM treaty, the anti-ballistic missile treaty that outlawed these so-called missile defense systems. The US walked away from the INF treaty, the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty that banned short range or battlefield nuclear weapons in Europe. And now the United States there already has nuclear weapons in Turkey, uh, Belgium, the Netherlands, Germany and Italy. The United States is now modernizing those very nuclear weapons in those countries. So I think Russia makes a strong case. At the same time, significant centers of, I guess what you'd call Washington elite policy making, this on the left, an article from Foreign Policy, the Atlantic Council's uh, Matthew 
Kronig talking about Washington must prepare for war with both Russia and China. And then on the right, General Milley, the head of the, uh, what's it called? Uh, the head of the, head of the military, uh, I forgot the name of it. Anyway, he, he, he's, uh, he, he's been warned repeatedly both by Russia and China to uh, back off these provocative steps that it's undertaking. At the same time, the United States, as you know, is flooding, the United States and NATO are flooding uh, Ukraine with various weapon systems, including the HIMARS rocket launcher with a range of up to 120 kilometers made by Lockheed Martin. And the US just a, a week or two ago said that Ukraine is authorized, can use HIMARS against targets in Crimea that is now part of Russia. And in fact, in the last month or two, uh, Ukraine has been shelling targets inside of Russia proper. Now, uh, a note to Washington, if you deliver HIMARS missiles to Ukraine with an extended range, Russia will have to move further into Ukraine to secure its own and the Donbass Republic's borders. Right now, Russia is primarily operating in the Donbass region of Eastern Ukraine, Ukraine, trying to liberate them from the hands of the Nazis that have been in control of that region since 2014. Another reason why the United States and NATO are so desperate these days to take down Russia and China is because they are rejecting the Western corporate colonial capitalist economic system. The upper left picture is BRICS. BRICS stands for Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. They've created an economic system that other countries, Iran and Argentina, have just applied for membership, and other countries throughout the world are applying. They want to have a, a economic system to rival the IMF and the World Bank. Because when you get a loan from the IMF and the World Bank, they, that loan has conditions. You have to get rid of your social spending. You have to sell off your assets your land, uh, you have to sell off your ports, your, your, you know, your various resources to repay that loan. And this is how the West continues its long hundreds of years of colonial policy to exploit the global South, the developing world. And then the picture on the bottom right is the Shanghai Cooperation Organization made up of Russia and China and other countries throughout Central Asia and other parts of Asia. And so these two entities are rivaling the economic power of the West. And one of their conditions at both BRICS and the SCO as it's called, Shanghai Cooperation Organization, is when countries make a loan, countries get a loan from either one of these two organizations, they're asked this question, what do you need? And then they say, well, we need an airport, we need a university, we need a rail system. And then they say, okay, we will give you the funds to do that. And let's work out a deal that you give us something in return. You know, it's a trade, but they're calling it at these organizations, a fair world order, a fair trade as opposed to the exploitive system of the IMF and the World Bank. Just one example, China, the picture on the right, has built this fast train to Laos as part of the Belt and Road Initiative. China is trying to create a transportation corridor between China all the way to Europe. And by doing so, the idea is to have a trading system that is not vulnerable to US and NATO interruptions 
of trade via ships in the oceans. One of the reasons why we see so much conflict between United States and China today is because the US has been working for years to develop the, cap the naval capability to choke off uh, China's importation of materiel to fuel their economy, particularly oil, natural gas, et cetera. And so by creating the Belt and Road Initiative, they are saying, we're going to have an alternative system for trade that doesn't exploit the way the United States does. The cartoon on the left, one of my all time favorite cartoons, basically illustrates the way the United States does trade with other countries. It invades, it takes over, it determines what you're gonna, what you're gonna grow, what you're gonna sell, how much you're gonna do it, where your resources are going. That's the US model. And most of, most, most, most of the world is over it. I have to say that when, after the Russian invasion began in February of Ukraine, we heard the United States uh, and, and its uh, NATO allies talking about sanctions on Russia. And we kept hearing that most of the world has joined the sanctions. Well, it's actually not true. That in fact, the global South, where the vast majority of the world population lives, I think it's 88% of the world population, those countries did not join the sanctions against uh, against Russia. And in fact, this is one reason why these sanctions are blowing back and essentially uh, crippling the economies, particularly in the European Union today. We often hear that Russia is just trying to recreate the Soviet Union. It wants to retake all the former uh, Soviet countries it wants to take over Europe. And so my response to that is the numbers don't lie. This graphic put out by the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute called CIPRI for the year 2020 lays out military spending around the world. And if you look down the list, you'll find Russia at 3.1% of the global total. Why the, while the United States is at 39% of the global total. This year, Russia is spending $66 billion, that's with a B, $66 billion on its military. Russia's military is a defensive military to protect its border regions all the way around that big country. Now, if you add up the United States figures to its NATO allies like England, Germany, France, Japan and South Korea, which are NATO partners and other countries as well that are in NATO, it reaches well over 50% of the world total. And so while Russia is spending $66 billion this year on the military, the United States is spending 800 billion plus, but when you add on the hidden pots of gold in the US military budget, like the Department of Energy's nuclear weapons spending, the US total is well over $1 trillion. So is Russia actually a threat to Europe and the rest of the world at $66 billion? I would suggest that it's not. Thank you for listening, friends. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, I guess uh, we can go to the question and answer period. Um, Greta, will you uh, take over from here? Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much, Bruce. Um, I'm seeing some virtual clapping. Um, so yeah, folks, you can put in questions in the chat box if you'd like us to read them off for you, 
or because we do have a small group and want this to be a, a discussion, you're welcome to use the raise hand feature and we can call on you and unmute you. Um, you can find the virtual raise hand option if you click on the reactions tab and then click raise hand. And I see we have one raised hand already from Sim, our Montreal chapter coordinator. So Sim, you're up next, here you go. Hi, thanks. Uh, great presentation. Very uh, compelling. Just very, wow. You know, it's, it's, I want to jump up and do something now. But I've been wondering about an email that I got today uh, from, um, uh, I forget her name, but she's a blogger that uh, writes about uh, Russia and, and uh, geopolitics. Anyway, I'm putting the link in here now. And she's talking about the, um, the, the shelling of a, uh, a prison in Ukraine and she says it was actually done by the Ukrainians and she has various evidence about why that would be a benefit to them and why they did that. And I just wondered what uh, Bruce would say about that. What, what is his opinion? Well, that prison was actually inside the DPR, the Donetsk People's Republic in Eastern Ukraine. And this is where the Nazis who were in Mariupol, you might remember there was a long siege in Mariupol inside of the Azov steelworks where yeah. more than 1500 Nazis were, were hunkered down and uh, Russia didn't just storm it, they just surrounded it. And over time, these people began to come out and surrender. And they've been taken to this prison inside of the DPR. So this is a uh, DPR run prison. And so the Ukraine used one of these HIMARS rockets that the United States has given to them and they shelled this prison and they killed not only 50 some of their own soldiers, prisoners, but they also killed the guards who were DPR military. So there's no way in the world that Russia would shell a a, uh, a place that, that where they have captured prisoners and who are now beginning to speak out. Many of these, I, I watch daily videos where these prisoners talk about how they killed civilians, innocent civilians uh, during their time in Mariupol, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, and, and that there are parts of these rocket debris with numbers on them, serial numbers and everything else. So Russia is able to clearly show that this was a Ukrainian operation and they've invited the Red Cross and other international organizations to come in and check everything out. So that's the story. You gotta be careful with the Western media, you know, because they have an interest to flip the story all the time. Thanks, Bruce. Okay, we'll go to the next. Uh, Mansoor, you can now unmute. And um, uh, Bruce, uh, good to hear from you again. Uh, you just touched on U.S. media. I do want to. Um, uh, I do want to ask you to expand on it. While New York Times, Washington Post, they always saying that Ukraine's winning this and winning that, and then. The, um, the, you would read the subtitles that Russia has gained a little bit more ground, Russia's doing this, Russia's doing that. If you could expand on the role of media in the US, especially on this war, thank you. R Russia's been going slow for several reasons. Number one, they don't trust NATO. They're only using 10% of their military forces in this operation. The DPR and the LPR, the Lugansk People's Republic, the Donetsk People's Republic, that after many years of trying to negotiate uh, through the Minsk agreements with Ukraine, they gave up and said, we're just gonna form our own republics, independent republics, Russia has recognized them. They have their own militias, self-defense forces, I call them. And so uh, they, along with 10% of the Russian army, have been fighting this slow, steady battle against the Kiev NATO-backed forces. On June 25th, the New York Times ran a story saying that the CIA and other allied intelligence agencies were inside of Ukraine and were running the war. They're giving 
The United States is giving satellite imagery, reconnaissance coordinates to Kiev so that when they launch the HIMARS rockets, they use those coordinates to target places like Donetsk City, where they're killing innocent civilians. Against They launch attacks against this, this prison where these prisoners of war uh, of the Kiev regime were, uh, were, were being held. So this is how this thing is going. And so Russia has never wanted to just go in and do a Baghdad kind of US bomb the hell out of everybody shock and awe. Because these are Russian ethnic citizens in the Donbass that they're trying to liberate. So they're going slow. But what happens is the United States has instructed the Ukrainian military to get inside of local civilian uh, places in towns that they control or cities they control, like schools, hospitals, people's apartment blocks. And so again, I've been following this story since 2014, literally daily. And I've watched millions of videos, it seems like, where I hear uh, Ukrainian citizens, after they've been liberated, say, we were kicked out of our apartment block. The Nazis set up uh, uh, operations, a base inside of our, our apartment. They took them over. They stole our food. They stole our, our clothes. And, uh, and they began uh, firing at Russia, uh, Russia, Russia as they came like into Mariupol from these places. And so Russia then would hit some of these places that had been turned into bases. And that's when we see the stories in the New York Times and the Washington Post is Russia is, civilian, uh, is shelling civilian targets. But in fact, the civilians had all been cleared out of there, chased out by the Nazis. They're hiding in some basement somewhere. And that's the way it's been. I'm going to go to a question from the chat. Um, Donald says, well, I certainly agree that the U.S. provoked Russia and is guilty of all sorts of aggression. Shouldn't we also condemn Russia's invasion? And I'll just say quickly, yes, at World Beyond War, we do condemn Russia's invasion as well. And we are anti-war from any perspective. But Bruce, I'll turn to you. Speaking only for myself, I ask you this question. Did the Native American people, when they were attacked by the U.S. Army, with the full modernized weapons of that period, did they have a right to defend themselves? Do the Palestinians today have the right to defend themselves against the genocidal attacks by Israel? Did the people of El Salvador and Nicaragua in the 1980s have the right to defend themselves against the US armed and backed Contras like in Nicaragua? And on and on we go with that story. International law says that when you are attacked, you have the right to defend yourself. And so I believe the people of the Donbass are defending themselves against, against the uh, combined efforts of the US and NATO forces. And in this case, Russia trying for years since the coup in 2014 has tried for all these years since then to negotiate the Minsk agreements, to try to work things out with NATO, asking for a pullback of uh, NATO expansion, the pullout of the missile launch bases in Romania and Poland, the aggressive war games that, the, that NATO is constantly running right up to the Russian border, including from Ukraine, by the way, before all this really started. So Russia felt that it had to help defend the Russian ethnic citizens in the Donbass. I think that that argument doesn't get enough uh, discussion, at least within the peace movement. And this is certainly a topic for a webinar in and of itself. And in fact, we are having a webinar in September on this topic of is war ever justified a debate with David Swanson. So if folks are interested in grappling with this question of how to defend yourself and methods of nonviolent defense, I'll put the link in the chat uh, on that webinar too. Um, and I will go to Andrew for the next question. You can now unmute. Yes. Hello, Bruce. Thanks for the conference. I'm very happy to meet you today and to have been able to listen to your conference and to see also the PowerPoint and the presentation. That's nice. 
uh, I just wanted to ask if uh, you think that it could very well be again an American war on resources as it was in every war, in fact. Yeah, I mean, uh, Vietnam, I remember very well, you know, I was in Saigon at the War Museum. And when you go up into the museum to the upper floor, because you're supposed to walk through the museum from the top down, the first thing you see is a quote about uh, John Foster Dulles, the CIA boss in 1953, where he explains how, you know, we cannot, America cannot uh, stop this war because it needs the tin and it needs, needs the tungsten to build better weapons, for example, yeah, because tungsten is used uh, in weapon industries. So it's very interesting to see, you know, that in Donbas, in Ukraine, not only Monsanto's and another three American agricultural industrial companies, uh, Kajil has been, for example, there and others, yeah. So it's not only the agricultural component, it's also the minerals. And the Donbas is the strongest region for uh, um, lithium, which is used to build the chips. And I don't know if you remember that in Afghanistan, for example, in 2000, and I think it was uh, 2010, that General Petraeus uh, was asked in front of Congress because uh, the United States Department had made a data set of Afghanistan. And in this data set, Afghanistan was, you know, nothing. It had nothing, right? It had no, no resources, nothing. And then on the 14th of June, suddenly General Petraeus is in front of the Congress and the news went into the, all the planet because he fainted. Yeah, he was dizzy, okay? And then he had to report about the richness of Afghanistan. And what came out? Lithium. Afghanistan has enough lithium to feed the entire Afghan population, 37 million Afghans, for the next 150 years. This is what General Petraeus explained. Thank you. Well, I think you, you expressed that very well. I would say you're absolutely correct. Almost all the wars in our lifetime have been about resources. And let's remember that Russia has been attacked every 100 years by Europe. Sweden, 40 some times, by the way, attacked uh, Russia. Poland, repeatedly. France with Napoleon. Hitler, Germany. So Russia is over it, to be honest with you. They're over it. They know that they are the richest resource country in the world. And they know everybody wants their stuff and that they'll do anything, including killing 27 million Soviet citizens during World War II, trying to get it when Hitler invaded. So Russia knows, they understand. And, uh, but you know, they say that uh, Putin says, America is treaty averse. If you don't know what averse means, look it up, reluctant, unwilling. America is unwilling to have treaties and stay with them. Why? Because it always has to have its way. It's the arrogance of entitlement that reeks in the heart of our country. Thanks. Okay, we have two more raised hands that we'll try to get to before the end of today's webinar. So I will call on Al Mitty, Central Florida Chapter Co-Coordinator with Larry. Uh, thanks, Greta, and, and uh, thank you, Bruce, for uh, for this wonderful presentation, very enlightening and all of that. The, uh, the title of it was, uh, as I understand, was, you know, what could trigger a nuclear war uh, with Russia and China? And, and Bruce, I'd like to hear your thoughts uh, on, on that in terms of the you, you touched on it a bit in the presentation in terms of the potential ex existential threat to Russia and the, the Arctic and, and so on. Um, do you see that as a, as a potential that either 
Russia feels like it's backed so much into a corner that the only thing it has left to try is a nuclear weapon. Or, or conversely, that NATO says, let's give this a try. Or now with, with China going on and then Pelosi and, and Taiwan and all. So could you talk a little bit about the, the nuclear threat that you see uh, that's there? Well, Russia and China have a no first use policy of nuclear weapons. The United States does not. But Russia and China have both said that if they were attacked and the United States and NATO, in this particular case, let's talk about Russia, the US and NATO, which I said has, NATO has uh, nuclear weapons in five NATO countries, Turkey, uh, uh, Italy, Germany, uh, Belgium, and Netherlands. And now we're told they're gonna be moving back into England as well. Uh, if those weapons are used in a battlefield situation, those are battlefield nukes, limited nukes, as they like to say, Russia says, we will have to respond likewise. And we will respond, they say, to those who are running this war against us. It's a very clear statement. We will respond to, let me just guess, Washington, London, Berlin, Paris, Brussels. Those would be the targets of Russian nuclear responses. Now, Russia, just yesterday, Putin issued another statement saying, we don't wanna have a nuclear war, it's the last thing in the world we want. But Putin has also said this, what kind of world would it be without Russia? He leaves that for people in the West to think about. All right, uh, last question from David Hartso, co-founder of World Beyond War along with David Swanson. David Hartso, you can now unmute. Thank you, Bruce, for your uh, presentation. Uh, my question is similar. Uh, if we have a nuclear war, it's gonna be suicide for all of us. Uh, what do you think we, the American people, uh, can do to try to stop this very, very dangerous situation? We have to take the log out of our own eye. Rather than spending peace movement time criticizing the Russians, criticizing the Chinese, telling the, I, I can't tell you how many emails I've received from peace people saying, oh, here's a really good uh, proposal for how to end this war. You know, Russia stopped doing this, Russia stopped doing that. Instead of wasting time doing that, people should be organizing inside of our own country to stop our own government who is initiated and is pushing and is sustaining this, this war that could become nuclear. And so our efforts should be aimed at our own country. And if there's someone on here from Canada, they should be talking to their country about their own role in NATO. And the fact that Canadians uh, have uh, special forces troops inside of Ukraine today, helping to fight and direct this war, as do all the rest of the NATO countries as well. So th this is kind of, to me, and, and, and David, I've known you a long time. I have the utmost respect for you. Please don't take this in any way personally. I don't mean it that way. But uh, we've got to uh, really look at our own country and our own role in this thing, our own tax dollars, how they're being used, if we really want to stop this madness from continuing. Uh, Nancy Pelosi going over to China, poking the dragon in the eye, at the same time we're poking the bear in the eye, is suicidal. So let's deal with our own country and call upon our own people to deal with our government and its excesses. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bruce. And on that powerful note, we are out of time for today's webinar. Bruce and Larry, I wanna to turn to you if you, either of you have any final closing remarks. 
Well, I would like to say that uh, thank you again to everyone for being a part of this call. I'm really appreciative. Uh, I'm, I understand the link to this uh, webinar will be sent around to everybody that participated. One way you can help is by sharing it in your community with other people. Uh, again, I invite you to look at my blog, which is called Organizing Notes. And uh, it's kind of uh, my daily diary of the work I'm doing. Uh, uh, so anyway, good luck to everybody. And this reminder, at the time of the collapse of the former Soviet Union, I'll never forget reading that the Soviet citizens, in order to figure out what was really going on, had to learn to read Pravda upside down. Pravda means truth in Russian, and it was the newspaper of the Soviet Union, the, you know, the main newspaper. Well, I would suggest that in our country today, we have to learn to read the New York Times and the Washington Post and watch the television and listen to the BBC and the NPR upside down because mo mostly what we're hearing is fabrications and lies written by the uh, CIA who's actually running not only this war, but running our country. Thank you. Well, uh, on this note, uh, I'd like to uh, thank Bruce for his outstanding presentation here. It was very enlightening. And it's something for us, as Bruce mentioned, that when we do get the link to the recording, to share it with our friends. Uh, and uh, we all need to work uh, for peace in the world. And, uh, you know, as, as humans, we're really barbaric uh, in, 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 in killing, you know. Uh, uh, it, it's only, uh, only for certain people in the bottom line, the root of all evil is money. And this seems to be uh, what all these wars are about is the bottom line is they have resources that we want uh, and it's about money and it's about a few people and everyone else has to pay the price. So uh, I want to thank uh, Bruce and every one of you for, our uh, for being a part of this today and uh, take this message forward. Uh, because it is uh, very enlightening. So thank you, and thank you, uh, Greta, for all your help. And yes, Bruce. Thank you. Wonderful, thanks everyone. Have a good rest of your day. Bye-bye.